welcome to the Asset Revolution Podcast, where each week, your hosts from Arbor Digital provide educational opportunities for financial advisors and individual investors to gain knowledge in this emerging powerhouse that is digital asset investing. The Asset Revolution Podcast is your connection to the future of digital assets and an opportunity for anyone to get off zero. Let's dive in. Welcome back to this edition of the Asset Revolution podcast. Uh, I am very excited to be joined today by Mike McLean from The Giving Block. Uh, We are going to talk about a few different things when it comes to gifting, donations, and philanthropy within digital assets. Um, But before we do that in today's episode, uh, Mike, welcome to the show, man. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, really happy to have you. I know we've been talking for a while now. I think about six months at least, and you know we've utilized you in some in some situations with investors and other clients uh, of ours, uh, and so we we appreciate the partnership. So this has been a long time coming. But- yeah, it's great. We have a, we have a lot to talk about. I think you know it's good timing too as we get into Q four, where where kind of our giving season is just around the corner, and uh, you know philanthropy is front of mind for for people at this point in the year. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, there's a lot of wealth managers out there, wealth strategists who, you know, as part of their business, you know, in that second half of the year, a lot of things what they're doing uh, in in that those sections of the year is focusing on making sure that everything is being executed on that front uh, into the manner which they plan for at the beginning of the year. So a lot of planning heavy conversations are about to happen. So this is a, a timely topic. Uh, but before we get into all of the good stuff we got today, mm-hmm. Man, introduce yourself to the audience. Let them know who you are and what you do at the Giving Block. Yeah, so um, so I'm head of institutional for the Giving Block. I, I joined in February of this year. Um, uh, prior to the Giving Block, I spent seven years at Fidelity Charitable, running uh, operations for private assets, uh, what we call complex assets, um, alternative investments, trading, crypto. Uh, over the seven years, kind of adopted all of those those roles um prior to my my time at fidelity charitable i spent uh gosh 15 years or so uh, across traditional financial services um company called sterling capital management out of charlotte i was an equity trader and a product manager there for a little while <clears throat> and then before that where i started my career up in boston at putnam investments um doing a few different things you know it's a little stereotypical but i um, started in the mailroom that was my first job out of college <laughs> um and, and ended up moving to to operations um and then middle office and then ultimately uh, made my way down to north carolina where I met the sterling folks wow that's a very rich and robust history right there and we always love where when you start i get i don't want to say the bottom but you start in the in the traditional front there and then you work your way up that shows a lot of dedication hard work um, and a lot of value that you've brought to move all the way up so just real quick for those of you, for those that may be listening, might not quite understand. What does a head of institutional at the Giving Block do? Yeah, let me let me start with kind of the story of the Giving Block and sure. how we got to institutional. So the Giving Block was founded in 2018 by by two uh, fine gentlemen, Alex Wilson and Pat Duffy, both uh, met at Wake Forest University. Um, and in 2017, if you remember what was happening in the crypto markets at the end of 2017. You know, in hindsight, it's not as impressive, but because we we saw Bitcoin hit sixty thousand. But in twenty eighteen, it, it it went parabolic, right? And in the month of December, we saw it it just touched on twenty thousand, and that was unheard of at the time. So early twenty eighteen, um, Alex and Pat got into conversation and said, "Hey, you know, we're we're hearing folks in nonprofits are struggling with crypto and 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 how to take crypto. So let's let's see if we can solve this for them." So really, the the Giving Block was founded. To, to help facilitate contributions of crypto for nonprofits. Now, how I got involved here is I met these guys in, gosh, 2021, early 2021. Um, and we just got into talking and I thought, you know, at Fidelity Charitable, we could we could use a solution similar to that. Because at Fidelity Charitable, we were doing, our, doing everything manually. Um, you know, and, and some of the challenges with crypto, as we know, 24-7 market, 
that's a little challenge, right? So mm-hmm. I, I got into conversations and they like some of the things that I I, I was talking about and decided to, to bring me on uh, to run what we call institutional. What institutional really means is, you know, we've got this core client base, which is like nonprofits that want to put our tool on their website and just drive fundraising through the tool. I'd say anything that falls outside of that is kind of in the institutional world. So organizations like large staff providers, large community foundations, trusted estate attorneys, wealth managers, they may want something a little bit different. Uh, not that it's not secure, but more around the, along the lines of legal risk compliance, audit concerns, reporting, things like that. So it's really a, a customization of the existing offering to fit sort of the unique needs of these, these larger organizations. That's great. And by DAF, you mean DAF, Donor Advised Fund, correct? Yeah, Donor Advised Funds, right. Perfect. Okay, so you're infidelity, charitable, you've met these great guys, uh, they want to bring you on. Take us, before we get, because this is always interesting to me, take us through a little bit, why did you decide to make a leap? Especially at that time, 2021, you know, thing, you know, things were kind of ripping a little bit. But I mean, there's a, especially if you're coming from the traditional world, like how do you know like why take that risk like you've got a you got a really good spot at fidelity you're working for a great company um obviously they have their own digital asset uh mm-hmm. group um i guess i'm just interested to hear more about what made you want to take the leap into into full in the crypto space with the giving block yeah so it's a good question <laughs> um so a lot of things kind of happened at one time right the crypto market ex- the the giving exploded in the, toward the end of 2021 um, you know, historically, I think we we were somewhere like 70 million in crypto for the first six years. And then in the last year, we did like 330 million in, in crypto in 2021, almost all of it in November and December. Wow. So we were kind of hitting a fever pitch and the, the existing process at Fidelity Charitable being so manual was was quite cumbersome. Um, so when I met when I met these guys, um, I thought it was really interesting, one, because it was something that I had been thinking about for a couple of years. Like, why isn't anybody solving this problem? (laughs) Yeah. And then immediately I started thinking, why aren't I solving this problem? Um, And then, you know, serendipitously, I meet Pat and Alex. I'm like, ah, ah, here's here's the solution. Um, You know, so, you know, I met them in early 2021. We had conversations about, you know, they were picking my brain. I was picking their brain all through 2021. And at the end of 2021, they came to me and they said, would you have interest in joining? Um, You know, the 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 second best option to kind of starting your own thing uh, Mm -hmm. is joining something that is is still fairly young 2018 to 2021 something three years Um, and it was perfectly aligned with something that I would have interest in doing and I knew given my background and my deep knowledge from the donor advice fund space processing all gifts of all kinds whether it's stock crypto uh, privately held uh, you know c corp s corp stuff right I could bring a tremendous amount of value to an already successful organization so that was super exciting to me Wow. Okay. So you've got, you've got this alignment now. Uh, there's this energy around it, this excitement. Um, and you figure now's the best time as any to go deliver that value in this specific space and solve that problem that you just knew had to be solved. Um, so let's dive in. So let's now go into now we've gone through a little bit of where, what is the giving block where we've been? Take us through where are you guys at now? Uh, what, are, what are some things that you guys are thinking about? What are some partnerships and how are you guys delivering value right now? Get, Take us through that. Yeah, so I think um, obviously the markets are, are have been a challenge this year, but it's all about, for, for me, it's all about Q4. That's really the Super Bowl is December. And that's kind of what my team has been planning for since I started. Um, <clears throat> so we're, what, what are we doing now is, is, is really business as usual on one side of the house, um, you know, still working with nonprofits, onboarding nonprofits to help them facilitate gifts of um, uh, cryptocurrency. Um, on my side, well, we've been working with some of these larger organizations to really figure out where their pain points are, mm-hmm. where the gaps in their process might be, where we can help out. Um, a couple areas where we're really spending a lot of focus, I would say number one is what we call private client service. So if you peruse the Giving Block website, sometimes it's referred to as PCS, so private client service. Mm-hmm. And what we can do there is one-off um, transaction processing. So if somebody has a, a larger gift, maybe they're not comfortable fully automating with our tool. 
we can handle that for them, whether it's it's crypto or uh, I think I, I mentioned to you before we, we started the, the call, uh, we uh, we added stocks. Uh, we're going to be doing stock contributions for charities starting in uh, in November, so we can we can process those through our, my PCS team as well. So I'd say that's that's one area where, where we're really focusing. The other is is again on that that stock piece, right? So I, what we what I brought to the team was this idea that hey, what did we learn? from this whole GameStop thing that occurred, right? Um, crypto users are also stock users. Stock users are also crypto users. I think there was a hypothesis that maybe that was the case, but it, given what we saw with GameStop and, and um, uh, what is it, AMC theaters, uh, with that, the, the whole mess that took place there was that there is an overlap between crypto users and stock users. So having the ability for a donor to come to the giving block and say, I'd like to give a little bit of crypto. I'd like to give a little bit of, of stock. We thought it was a nice opportunity for us to kind of put those two, those two assets together under one tool. That's wonderful. It does seem like there's a lot of alignment between those two areas to, to be able to offer that solution. And so that way you don't have to segment out them and they, well, they may want to use you for both, but they can't, but now you can go ahead and service them fully uh, through that offer. That's great. Well, so walk us through, cause I know just, I, I, you know, talking to, you know, advisors, investors, you know, I think when you start talking about gifting crypto, I think they start wondering like, well, how the heck do you even do that? <laughs> can, can, can you just walk through the process? How, how did you guys, how do you guys approach about it? Think about it? Um, is it easy? Walk us through. Yeah. Let me start by telling you that over the last nearly eight years, I've been a party to tens of thousands of contributions for billions of dollars. Uh, and I can tell you that the easiest asset to gift is cryptocurrency. It's not even close. I mean, cash is probably second to, to crypto. So how do we how do we process these gifts for nonprofits? Um, primarily for the nonprofits that are, that are clients of ours, they have a tool that, that goes right on their website um, and they can drive their donors to that tool like you would any other donate here button on your website. So if, if you want to make a donation to your local charity, uh, Mark, you could just go to the charity, assuming they're a client of ours. You can pick the token that you want to give. There's something like 80 to choose from uh, in the tool, select the amount and right in the tool will give you an, an estimated amount of the gift. Uh, so if you're trying to hit a, a dollar amount, you can calibrate in real time. Uh, and then you just make your way through the tool, give us some, some information so we can give you a tax receipt. Then we're gonna give you a QR code and a wallet address from so you can push it from your your wallet to to the the nonprofit's wallet at, at our exchange partner, and and once the uh, crypto is received at the exchange partner, it's instantly converted to U.S. dollars, and then the nonprofit will receive the proceeds in their bank account. So there's there's nothing for the nonprofit to do other than tell their donors go to our website and give us some crypto. Wow, it sounds like there are a lot of tech pieces here, both from traditional and then as well as kind of the new infrastructure with wallet. Uh, technology that you guys are implementing and found a pretty good solution to where it makes it easy, not just for the, the nonprofits and the organizations, but it makes it easy for me as the donor to be able to just scan a QR code, use my phone, uh, and then to be able to give that donation. Is that what I'm hearing? That's 100% right. And the, and the beauty of it is because, because as I mentioned, you know, with the 24-7 nature of the crypto market, it makes it a little bit challenging for, for nonprofits. But with our tool, we're, it's all automated and process it 24-7. So if a donor wants to make a gift on a, on a Saturday afternoon after coming from a, a charitable event or something, they can mm -hmm. do it. They can do it all weekend long and on holidays is 24-7. Wow. Uh, and again, that's, that's something that's revolutionary about these markets and the, the technology that's being developed is this idea of 24 seven uh, is always on uh, 24 seven, 365. Yeah. So I guess that leads to another question then. So how about reporting? How about generating tax? Like, do I have to go and do all that now? How is that done? Is that all automated as well? Yeah. The, for the donor, from the donors, even from the, the, the nonprofits perspective, it's, it's fully uh, automated through our, our tool. Right. So what'll happen is um, you'll get a receipt almost instantly for your gift. Now the gift isn't, the gift receipt isn't gonna have the dollar amount. It's just going to say, thank you, Mark, for your gift of three Bitcoin to the nonprofit of choice. What you have to do there is um, 
is, is take that gift receipt to uh, an official a certified appraiser. Right. Okay. So uh, for so since the IRS considers crypto property, it does require a, a third party fair market value um, for gifts over five thousand dollars. Now, where the IRS has has it with the language of the IRS uses is for gifts of similar assets. So actually, Mike, let me pause you real quick. I should have opened up the, the episode with this and I'll, pro I'll put this at the beginning as well. But just for everyone listening, uh, Mike and I are not CPAs. We are not tax advisors. Uh, this in no way should be considered tax advice. Um, this is purely educational. Uh, if you do have needs or have questions and need to develop a certain tax strategy or want to go and gift and, and donate uh, in digital assets, please consult with a CPA. If you don't have anybody, if you don't know who to work with, then we highly suggest you get in touch with either myself or Mike offline, and we can connect you with the, to those people that can. Uh, but we'll we'll make sure to put that in there. Mike, I'm sorry to interrupt you right there, um, but no, that is important, continue. right? That is important because you know this is what I can say is that the the IRS considers crypto property. Yep. And in certain cases, you may need to get a third party fair market value, um, but certainly want to consult with your your tax professional because each each gift um, and the fact and circumstances of each person are, are different. So mm -hmm. you're going to want to consult with your, your, your tax professional. Um, but to, your, to answer your, your question, yeah, we provide the receipt, we provide all the reporting. Um, and that's the beauty of, of blockchain. Um, you can go right to the hash on the blockchain and the specific date, time and second and, and see that transaction. So when I say it's one of the easiest gifts, that's, that's one reason. Uh, the other reason is instant settlement. Um, whereas mm -hmm. if you want to give a gift of stock, um, as easy as stock is to sell in most cases, uh, you do have to wait two days. It's a two-day settlement, and then you can get your money, right? Crypto is, is instantaneous. Yeah. Walk us through some of the other challenges then that you've seen in traditional gifting and donating or philanthropic efforts that you see with these new systems that are being improved. Yeah. <laughs> Let me start with stocks because I just spent the last few months kind of researching that and trying to launch this at, at, at the giving block. You know, it's it's when I had to, to explain to this group of leaders at the startup that in order to facilitate stock contributions, we had we have to fax or donors have to fax broker forms. To Wait, what's company. a what's fax? What is what does that exactly. stand for? <laughs> yeah. I don't even know what it stands for anymore. <laughs> but you know, it's nice. I you know, there were like heads they were like, you can't be serious. They thought I was joking. I said, no, this is entirely mm -hmm. the case. So that's that's a big challenge. You know, there's paperwork that needs to be filled out. You have to email it or fax it to a broker. In some cases, you have to get a medallion signature stamp. I was going to say, that doesn't <clears throat> sound like the most secure solution anymore either. No, I mean, it's it's definitely not, I, I, in my opinion, it's not as secure as crypto. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, that is, that's a significant um, obstacle for people, especially in December. Right. It's just you, you, you've got a lot of things on your mind at, at the end of the year. If uh, you just decide the day after Christmas, oh, I'm going to make a charitable gift. It's too late. Mm -hmm. I mean, by the time you fill out paperwork, get it to your broker, uh, and then assuming they move really fast, you're probably still not going to get it in time for 1231. So that's 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 one challenge that we don't have with crypto is all of this upfront paperwork. Um you know, that, that needs to be filled out by, before a donor can even hit go. Yeah. And that's a great way to explain it and to explain kind of the value add to this new technology is because I, I know as a practicing mm -hmm. advisor, I can't tell you how many times, no matter how much I would work with uh, my clients to you know do all of these great strategies, you know, making sure that we had the the gifting and that we had our taxes in line, we had our financial planning, like everything was well-oiled machine, but then obviously it takes action. It takes executing it. Um, and then inevitably life happens and that's okay. Yeah. And the one thing that, you know, really would separate a lot of, you know, advisors from each other were the ones who maybe had the connections to get things done, maybe in a faster turnaround time from an operation standpoint than before. And whereas if you're, I just said, I just remember being in those chaotic moments at the end of the year and just having so many clients who save things for the last minute and then I'm trying to deliver that value for them, even though we tried to prep, prepare for it. 
And in this new system and this new technology that we can use with wallets and blockchain, we can actually get rid of a lot of those headaches. And again, even with smart contracts, and again, I'm kind of going off the rails a little bit here, but think about if we start implementing smart contracts and oracles to be able to execute on these things without even having to worry about, you know, that button pressing and we can just schedule it. Like there's so much more efficiency. And then when you talk about outcomes, think about all of the, the outcomes that you can avoid, the bad outcomes you can avoid because you were late, because you waited to the last minute. If I'm an investor, if, I, if I'm someone trying to execute on these strategies with my advisor, you know, I, I can kind of take that off my mind and I can do that. And it just sounds like this is, we're already starting to see, it. this is real. This is happening right now. Yeah. Am I, am I getting this wrong? Like, cause again, I think a lot of the, oh, if I were someone who still were in the crypto space or looking at it or doing due diligence, like, um, you know what? And it, this is what we hear from people, you know, a lot of the stuff is still just promised. Nothing is actually getting done. This actually still doesn't work yet, but here we are. And we're talking yeah. about, it sounds like it actually is. We're doing it now. Yeah, it is. It is working. Um, <clears throat> you know, we're, I don't think we're, we're at the giving block at the using smart contracts just yeah. yet. I, I think there's some interesting use cases as we get through the end of the year and into next year. Um, but going back to your your earlier point about you know having a lot of things to consider, um, that's another benefit that we we can provide beyond the tax receipt, um, the dreaded IRS forms eighty two eighty two and eighty two eighty three. We actually fill those out for the the donor and the nonprofit to the best we can. We obviously can't sign it and we can't put a value on it, but. Sure. Um, but we can populate that based on the information provided to us by the donor. And even better, from an advisor's perspective and from a former operations leader's perspective, the great part about it is if the donor has an account with us, we'll store that 8282 right, uh, and 8283 right in their account. Because I can promise you on April 14th, <laughs> you will get a phone call saying, did you send me that? you know, that form that I needed for my crypto, because I need it right now. Um, you know, and then you're, you're scrambling to find another one or print it or whatever. It's it's right available, it's available right online for the, for the donor. Yeah, that's when we talk about what are the things that most advisors value, it's time and quality, quality execution. So that's, that solves for that right there. Um, man, this is, this is great. And I think one thing I also wanted to ask you about while I have you here is I think it's really important to start highlighting too is because you guys are in the space and because you guys have the knowledge of, you know, crypto, the different tokens, and you at least have a fundamental understanding of it, I think you then can also start recognizing kind of the not so good side, right? Um, so have you guys run into any situations to where maybe things didn't quite look right? And I don't know if you can see where I'm going with this, but uh, <laughs> yeah, let's just say, yeah. I don't want, I hate using the word scam. I don't want to like scare anybody, but yeah. there's a lot of stuff happening that we need to help people be protected from in terms of scams and, you know, things that are really fishy. And sometimes things may look just really good on the surface, but have you guys come across any scenarios, especially because I know that even though gifting and donating is well-intentioned and, you know, meant to be a force for good. We know that things can happen. And especially in the crypto space where it seems all the headlines want to focus on is the negative side of that. Um, can you talk to us a little bit? Have you guys run into any situations that, you know, weren't quite so pretty? Yeah, look, I mean, I, before I started uh, in my career in kind of uh, Fidelity Charitable, I would never have guessed that people would, maybe I, I'm, I'm naive, but may, I never would have guessed that people would have used uh, fraudulent 501c3s to, for nefarious purposes. Would never even occurred to me. Um, but they do indeed do that. And it's not just with crypto. They use I was going to say, did you see that on the traditional side as well when you were at Fidelity? Yes, definitely. Um, actually, the, the few circumstances that that I was aware of was not crypto related. It was, okay. uh, there were other assets, but, but to, your, to answer your point, yeah. I mean, that's another benefit you get with um, the giving block. And I'll, I'll preface this by saying as someone who was not kind of fully in the crypto space before crypto expertise, especially right now uh, is hard to come by. Right? It's hard. It's hard to hire because um, there's not that many 
the crypto experts um, and holding on to them is is really really tough um i'm, I'm probably evidence of that as, as i left you know traditional <laughs> financial services and went to a crypto company but one of the benefits you get with partnering uh with us um i'll give you an example we worked with a, a large community foundation uh, about a month or two ago and they called and they said we're really excited we have a we have a large pending gift from a a new donor uh who's who's called and we've had a phone conversation with this donor and it's a large gift um but this they said what, what we want to what are some of the questions we want to we want we need to ask this donor because this is doesn't want to use the widget tool that you guys have once which is fine that's a pcs that's what we're here for uh so we we, we gave them some questions and they, they asked to set up a call with us and um I think within 60 seconds of hearing this donor's responses, we said, this is not legitimate. Um, you know, there was a couple of things that we were, we had come up early, um, given the size of the gift, this person was talking about, given the location of the community foundation, um, we started to question the legitimacy. So we armed them with some key questions. And when they came back, we said, uh, we, we wish we could tell you that you're going to get a large gift of Bitcoin, but um, our, our our opinion is that this is probably not legitimate. Um, so fast forward a couple weeks later, they came back and they said, yeah, this this is not a legitimate donor. So um, <clears throat> so there's 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 a benefit there, too. Like we we would love to be able to 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 say that we we process this really large gift. But I'm also as happy to say that we helped a, a foundation, nonprofit foundation, avoid uh, any kind of scam or or uh nefarious act being really you know tied to nefarious activity absolutely i mean there is so much happening still as much as we as much as crypto and digital assets and blockchain there are so many good things these are tools it's technology that they're tools but just like any tool uh, it can be used for good and again or it could be used for nefarious reasons or you know evil is the way we put it mm -hmm. here um and it's important to know that no matter what industry you're in, like, I, I think I was just just reading an article around a church organization that was set up in the Midwest, um, came out to be just a full scam. And they were just trying to get donations and gifts uh, for the last three years. And it just really reminded me that, oh, this still happens everywhere. And it's really important. We have to be forces for good. And while we may want to say we don't want the traditional to come in, like crypto is its own thing, it's okay. We can take a lot of the things that we've learned and things we've set up to help protect people that actually do protect people, not just you know me at the SEC saying, oh, we're here to protect investors. There are legitimate firms that help protect and avoid these drastic events that could have led to really poor outcomes, not just for the people involved, but for the organizations. Um, but I think that's what's helping drive adoption at the institutional level. Right. And that's why we're seeing mm -hmm. the, some of these major bank players come to market, because in the early days of crypto, there was no overlap between crypto and financial traditional financial services. Um, you know, no regulators. There's still very little regulation in crypto. But um, as folks like me who have 20 years of experience in, in traditional financial services comes over to the, the pure crypto world, I bring with me some use cases for, you know, compliance and best practice and uh and things like that to consider um and i think that gives confidence to people that are coming to crypto uh for the first time mm -hmm. where they know that there's 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 more of the traditional financial service kind of bleeding into crypto now not fully but um i think what we're doing is we're taking the best use cases from traditional financial services and we're bringing them into crypto very well said and i'd love to extract some of that wisdom that you just mentioned here a little bit could you would you mind sharing if there were one maybe two different important pieces to consider when you are approached about giving crypto donations or gifts uh to look for yeah i mean on the on the institutional side of the giving block what we hear quite frequently and i knew this coming into it from fidelity charitable kyc is is really important to some of these larger organizations because they need to know who the donor is that's giving them a gift and it's not just crypto it's any any gift um so when they when they see how how easy and frictionless crypto is it almost scares them say okay if it's a mm -hmm. bad actor it's almost too easy so that's where my team can come in and say well you know 
if if you're not comfortable having a public facing tool where just anybody can donate, we can surely put that behind a login. We can put it, you know, create a separate landing page. Um, we can customize it to however these folks need, right? So that's something that that I think I bring from from Fidelity Charitable, which is you know very risk averse mm-hmm. um, to a to a a crypto startup um, that is you know any crypto startup has been running pretty pretty quickly, you know, and saying for these t- types of clients, they may have other considerations. Um, and it's been well received at, at the giving block. They, they, they think it's, it's great to be able to meet those, those large organizations kind of where, where they are and, and, and given their, their unique considerations. That's wonderful. And I guess that this is a good time. I, I, I share an experience from us at Arbor Digital, you know, as our offer is to be the outsourced digital asset arm of any RIA or advisory firm across the the U.S. and we have a client in the Midwest who they had a cl- uh, one of their end clients was a an organization they wanted to accept crypto donations and they had no idea what how to how to go about it and you know because this advisor had us as a partner and when they put in a, the request we had a very easy solution to implement we made the connection the same day and then I know you guys all connected and they were able to be taken care of and. Again, a lot of those questions come up around KYC and making sure we're taking the necessary steps to protect at the same time. And that's where I think from us, when we were when we were doing due diligence with the giving block and we had discussions, you know, it's really just about that infrastructure uh, that really said this is this this is where we need to we need to focus. Um, so yeah, that's I'd, also, I know. I'd also uh, point out that if, even if um you know, you're okay, even if a nonprofit, which most nonprofits are okay with putting putting the, the tool right on the public facing site, the, the contributions aren't coming blind. Um, we partner with Gemini as our exchange. They do a blockchain scan on every transaction and they do an OFAC uh, review. So if it's coming from a wallet registered in, in an SDN listed co- uh, country, Iran, North Korea, they will not allow the transaction to go through. Uh, so we do, there, there are eyes on every transaction, um, but some nonprofits want to do a little bit more uh, KYC on, on the donor before the transaction starts mm-hmm. to move, uh, knowing that they do have that other safety net with the blockchain scan and the SDN list review. Man, see, this is why we we bring we brought you on. Uh, you're already thinking well ahead. I was going to ask you about that. You know, one of the things that comes up with, you know, especially wallets and the identity uh themes within this space is this idea of KYT, know your transaction. Um, and you just kind of went through kind of how you guys uh, work with Gemini on that front. Uh, is there anything else uh, from a compliance standpoint or, or from a risk standpoint uh, when gifting or donating or, e- or even just thinking about any philanthropic activities uh, that you would uh, highlight here? Uh, from, a, from a know your client, from a risk perspective, um, it's documentation, right? Um, Anytime we have a transaction, we, we're, we're recording it. We have all the reportable information. You just want to save that, right? Want to make sure you have a policy around your the length of time that you're doing you know, your document retention um, and and where you're saving the documents, who has access, all that stuff, right? So if you do, if, you know, if we or a nonprofit gets audited and they say we need um, transactions for the last three years, okay, here you go. Um, you know, if we have a policy that says we destroy all documentation after X years, unless we can stand behind that and our auditor says, yeah, we agree with that. Um, I, I think some of those things are, are starting to bleed over from traditional financial services as um, we're starting to get kind of more more mainstream with crypto. Um, some of these uh, these things, you know, as, as investors from traditional financial services who have just become accustomed to these things is just normal. Mm-hmm. Um are expecting this on the crypto side and, and we're, we're, we're trying to catch up to some of that stuff. Well, it's, it's great to see how quickly and how committed that you and the team over at the giving block is to making sure that these pieces are in place for advisors like us and who have clients of advisors who are trying to deliver value to, to clients who they know are engaging with this asset class. They know they have it. And I think the more what we've been in the space, the more situations we've encountered, and it's been really easy for us to say, "Great, we've already got a strategy for this." You know, because we've been in the traditional world, you've got a 
a highly concentrated position that's built up over the last six years in a certain you know asset that you've you've bought and you're wondering what are some ways that you can help curb you know taking gains on that so it's, it's an easy conversation to have and they realize like and I think it because they're and maybe you can speak to generationally the it's almost like a new generation investor who has been in it very early and they're realizing that the traditional view of what a what an advisor does or the value of financial advice whatever that means is very different than just getting like investment tips or knowing where to put your money from an investment standpoint. It's being able to work with partners like us and you guys to, you know, holistically bring these types of wealth strategies to, to their situation. Yeah. It's about asset protection as well. Right. We want to, we want to, especially for, for nonprofits, right. It's so the last thing we want is for some, some activity to take place where these nonprofits lose money that they're counting on to drive their mission mm -hmm. um so that's that's a big thing that drives us and, and I, I i i don't think to date i've ever met anybody who doesn't have a, a, a direct connection to some nonprofit mission of, of some kind uh and, mm -hmm. and if, i think if i ever met somebody who didn't i'd say well you're you're very very lucky <laughs> <laughs> because most of us have, have have had something that drives us in one direction or another mm -hmm. um and that you know people call that passion um you know for me I, there's a couple things that nonprofit related missions that i i'm very close to for personal reasons um and it would it would gut me if anything ever happened to those nonprofits who trusted us mm -hmm. um and something was to happen that's very well said. And one thing I was hoping that we could dive into a little bit too, uh, kind of in the in this vein uh, of passion. I know you guys did a lot of work to set up things for what's going on overseas in the Ukraine. Can you talk a little bit about how you guys have been able to participate? Yeah, that that's one thing that the, the Giving Block has done that I think is really, really innovative is these idea of these impact index pools or in, impact index funds. Um, so effectively, I'll start with that and then I'll get into Ukraine. Um, <clears throat> what they've, what they've done is on our website, if you go to our website, you can see the different impact index pools. And if a donor comes and says, I don't know, I've got, uh, $20,000 of some crypto. I, I, I want to make a gift, but I don't know who to, which I don't have a specific charity in mind. We have these impact index funds where, uh, once a, a nonprofit is onboarding with us, they can pick, I think it's two, it's one or two different themes. Mm -hmm. um, so we have one that, you know, let's say it's um, uh, um, climate related or environmental, right? Environmental says environmental. And we've got 15 or 20 nonprofits in that impact index fund that that relate to environmental good. I, I'm either donor I might say, I don't know where I want to give this to, but I want to impact the environment. So I'm going to put it in the impact index fund. And then once a month, we we disperse equal equal share across all the participants in that impact index fund. So if there's 20 nonprofits and there's $20,000 at the end of the month, each nonprofit's going to receive a thousand dollars. So that solves a problem for, for donors that want to come in and do more, um, but don't have specific nonprofits in mind. So we did something similar with the Ukraine. we created a Ukraine impact index funds fund for nonprofits that are, were helping, with what's going on in Ukraine. Um, and so now donors can come in and say, I don't have, I don't know which nonprofits specifically are helping with the Ukraine, but I know I want to help with Ukraine. So here's my half a Bitcoin. Wow. Having the infrastructure to be able to support something like that, it just, it's, it's really great to see. And you don't hear about a lot of these things. Again, I think there was a lot of headlines around, you know, crypto being used to send money to Ukraine, but then there was always this that it was going to be used for nefarious purposes and that no, there was a lot of really good energy coming from and especially because of the rails, because of the wallet and the blockchain technology, you're able to gift in in numerous in numerous ways. So, uh, I'm really happy that you guys were able to participate uh, create avenues for which people can go donate, even if they didn't quite know how to do that. Um, so just, you know, just as a human being, uh, from me to you, thank, thanks to you and the team for, for having Yeah, me. it's, it's a great idea. Uh, I wish I had thought of it. Um, <laughs> so it's just a great idea. And, and I will say this, um, we do do due diligence, um, before we onboard a 501c3. So mm -hmm. we, we're, 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 we are very much aware that there are, um, bad actors that are trying to use 
uh, nefarious 501c3s, we do due diligence before we onboard them. So you know that if you're making a gift to the Ukraine fund, that it's going to a nonprofit that we've, we've, you know, vetted and, and we're okay with. That's great. So I think we've jammed on a lot so far today. Um, I'd love to take the, the la this little last section here uh, to talk a little bit about where you guys are going. So can you tell us a little bit about that? What's happening at the Giving Block? I know you guys just rolled out, you know, being able to do stocks uh, being launched in November. Um, I know that you guys are diligently working at many other things, but can you give us some insight into what you guys are looking towards? What's your roadmap, I guess? Yeah, I think um, none of us are looking past December 31st at this point, right? We're, we're about to get into giving season and my first giving season in 2015 started effectively probably December 1st. And then every year it starts a little earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we're kind of into October is, is the unofficial start of giving season. So we're, um, we're laser focused on making sure that we've got all of our nonprofits onboarded and they're ready to go. They have what they need. Um, and we've got uh, what we need on our side for, for that PCS offering. <clears throat> and then um, our stock, stock offering that we're launching we all we also did just launch with with any nonprofit that uh, is on board with us since we were acquired in march by a publicly traded company called shift four they're a payment processing company um we do offer card services so credit card debit card uh, we've got some i think we got apple pay uh, google pay coming up we got ach coming early early 2023 um so i, th I think looking past december for me I love that we're, we're getting more into kind of traditional assets because I think it's with the great wealth transfer that I think is probably already started, but over the next three to five years, for those who don't know, it's like the three to $5 trillion is going to, going to make its way to, to the millennial uh, from, from the, the boomers. Um, that's going to, a lot of that's going to find its way to crypto. Um, and it's certainly going to find its way to traditional assets. And I think if we learn anything, millennials are, are even more philanthropically inclined um, mm -hmm. than their predecessors. So I, I think it's really important that we give not only nonprofits a seamless solution for fundraising as much as they can of whatever we can help facilitate right now. That's crypto uh, cash via cards and then stocks. Um, you know, I, I, I certainly, without, I don't want to give too much away, but I'm certainly exploring other assets that we could facilitate through our tools. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've got a couple of immediates that I'm going to tackle in Q1 of 23. And I'm really excited about. Well, great. Uh, it's, it's great to know you guys are laser focused on adding value. It's good to know that you all are just as excited for it. the real merge that's taking place, or I shouldn't say the real merge, the other merge that's taking place with the traditional and Web3 crypto, this new evolution of the internet. Um, we see that the same, and it's it's nice to know that we have disciplined, responsible uh, people such as yourselves in the space working towards those goals. So, um, man, Mike, it's been such a pleasure jamming with you on this. I, I know we've got, there's a lot of juice in this episode. Um, but what, I, what I'd like to end off with is just throwing you some quick fire questions that I always like to do with every guest on the show. Um, so in a, in a word or a, a phrase or a sentence, uh, I'm looking for some answers to some quick hit questions. Are you down? I'm ready. Okay, great. So the first one is what is an achievement outside of work and family that you are most proud of? Um, whew, that's a tough one. Um, about a year ago, I did get my CrossFit level one and I now coach CrossFit, uh, at a local CrossFit. And I'm really excited about, uh, of doing that. One thing that gets really excited is, is sharing my knowledge, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> whether it's crypto or at CrossFit and, and, um, you know, when, when I get to mention something to something and watching the light bulb go off, I'm like, ah, oh, they get it. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what gets me through the day. Oh, you like those magic moments. I love it. Well, yeah. I may need to talk with you offline about that. I need to be taught a thing or two. So uh, that's really cool. Congratulations on that. Um, shifting more to the to the crypto side, then what's something that digital asset or crypto detractors get right? Oh, this feels like a trap, Mark. Um, <laughs> no, no traps uh, here. I mean, look, it's volatility. 
Uh, I mean, crypto acts like a growth stock, which is already inherently volatile, but then you add that 24 um, seven, you know, into it, it creates, it creates a unique dynamic uh, in the sense that growth stocks at four o'clock, everybody can stop, take a breath, assess what happened and, and plan for the next day or the next week. You don't have that opportunity in crypto because right? as you're taking your breath and stepping back and assessing, it's still, go, it's still happening. And the world is still moving, you know, the crypto world is still moving forward. So that creates a, a unique challenge. But I think as new entrants come to the market, especially from traditional finance, we're already seeing this in some of these OTC markets where they're bringing some traditional trading mechanisms over to crypto, like VWAP algorithm, TWAP, stop loss, limit orders, things like that, that can help mitigate some of those things uh, as as nobody works 24-7. Very well said. So the last question I have here for you is what has been the most influential learning resource as you've gone into the crypto world? Uh, on the job training, <laughs> really. Um, but I, I have a few a few um, things I can, I can share with you. Obviously, if you want to, if you haven't read it, anybody who's listening to this, if they haven't read the, the Satoshi white paper, start there. That is ground zero, literal ground zero for mm. what, what, what the idea of crypto and blockchain was intended to do. So I'd start there. I'm also about halfway through um, this book. And now let me be clear, this is not going to keep you on the edge of your seat, but it's called Token Economy. And it really breaks down Web3 and crypto and blockchain um, to, to, to something that's really digestible to someone who might not be crypto native. Mm. So I, I would check that one. It's called Token Economy. I can't remember who, who authored it. And then the third one, just because I really enjoy his books by Ben Mesrick, he's got a book called Bitcoin Billionaires. Mm -hmm. um, now, Ben Mesrick's books are all grounded in fact. I think he takes some liberties for entertainment purposes, but it's really, I mean, there's three different options there, right? Right. What, the white paper is just fact-based token uh, economy will help be more educational and Bitcoin billionaires is a really entertaining take on, uh, on the rise of Bitcoin. Okay. And you know what? I'm going to throw in a last question. Thank you for sharing those, those resources, by the way, uh, just because I'm really interested. Your answer has been really good. What's your biggest pet peeve about people that are crypto native? <laughs> I might get in trouble for this one. Some of the, um, I was just talking about this the other day. Some of the, some of the lingo. Um, I still refuse to say hodl. Um, <laughs> I'm strictly hold. I, I just can't, I can't get. And then of course, when I, when we announced at the giving block um, that we were going to embark on this journey to explore stocks as a, as a charitable gift, you know, all through Slack, stonks and stonk. I'm like, what is this stonks thing? And I mean, it's the Gen X in me that I'm like, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. I uh, see. I knew I was going to get a good answer out of that. Oh, man, that's that's really interesting. Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of tradi especially traditional uh, professionals who are starting to make the leap, such as you and such as me, and they're getting this new new language to learn. Uh, and it's not always. Uh, needed <laughs> yeah it's funny because it's some of these uh, some of the slack conversations i just like read it i'm on google like i'm trying to decipher like what they're talking about because some of it's like where, where's this coming from yeah. yeah but also it also then puts in why it's important to have people who you know that are in the space that can do that oh, yeah. and understand that language for sure um yeah and i'll say one thing about the crypto native folks um they're very very open to explanation and and, and teaching um even even to me when i reach out i said what is what do you mean by this they don't they're, they're happy to sit down and take some time to explain it yeah no that's that's actually one of the things we've we've loved and learned it's actually been a little surprising because we do see some what is, shall we say um what is it what do they call them the bitcoin mac we, we do see some maximalism right with with some communities but in general i would say there's a lot more healthy collaboration in terms of people just willing to share. Because again, we're all working towards the same goal and trying to push this industry forward responsibly and in an intelligent way at the same time. So, yep. well, man, 
thank you so much for for doing those quick fire questions with me. Uh, hope I didn't put you too much in the hot seat. Uh, but no, it's been, not at all. It's been wonderful having you, uh, jamming with you on this topic. Uh, I'm excited for everyone to listen. So last thing uh, to end off, let people know, and we'll put some things down in the show notes as well, but where can people find you? Um, yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn. So that's probably the best place to reach out. Um, and of course, if you go to the giving block, you can, you can click on my profile and email me directly. It's just mike.mcclain at thegivingblock.com. Uh, if anybody wants to reach out, schedule time to learn more, happy to happy to set up some time. Wonderful. Well, again, Mike, thank you for being here. I can't wait till maybe even next year when we've gone through <laughs> some more ups and downs. Uh, we'll oh, yeah. see where, where everything's at. Hopefully more ups than downs. <laughs> We're right there with you on that one. Well, again, thanks. Thank you for joining. Everybody, thank you for listening to this edition of the Asset Revolution podcast. Be sure to tell somebody today that you care about them. And we will see you next time. Cheers, everybody. We appreciate you listening to this edition of the Asset Revolution podcast. I'm your host, Mark Nichols. Please don't forget to let us know how you like the show by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen. For more downloadable digital asset resources and educational opportunities, please visit us at arbordigital.io. We are here to help you get off zero safely and securely. Thanks again for tuning in and be sure to tell someone you care about them. Cheers. financial advisor. Unless you're under contract with or actively speaking with Arbor Capital Management or Arbor Digital, a division of Arbor Capital Management. This podcast is just that, a podcast. It is not financial, legal, or tax advice. If you have individual questions, please reach out.